This morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 44, on page number 849 in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money in the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called to his disciples and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Darcy. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. You all rested. Got an extra hour of sleep last night. You should be. And uh, so uh, you can be ready to engage this morning. Hey, you know what I want to do? I want to, I want to do something we don't, we don't do very often. Well, because it doesn't happen very often. But we have a very important day on Tuesday, right, in the life of our country. And um, and, and, and I, I want to just remind us to, to be sane about what's happening and to keep a biblical perspective on this. The Bible says so clearly that there is no one who comes to power in the world, including the President of the United States, uh, without God saying yes. God's yes doesn't mean approval, by the way. God has said yes to tyrants in this world, in the Bible, but he does it for his own glory and his own good pleasure, and he does it because there's things that he can bring about even in the midst of that. And so I want to remind you that no matter what happens on Tuesday, Jesus Christ is sovereign and ruling over all. And we can take incredible comfort in that. So whether your guy gets in or not, that's not the issue. That's the first thing I want to remind you. The second thing is, is that in this room right now, we've got Democrats, Republicans, Tea Party, Independents, you, probably every stripe. And if you're a believer in Jesus, you are not, you are not your party. You are a child of God. And what binds us together is not political affiliation. What binds us together is the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? So you know what I want to do? I want you to stand with me. And I want us to just call out to God for a moment. And, and, and you know what? I, I, I'm not trying to be corny here. I'm really not. Would you do me a favor and just grab the hand of the person next to you and stretch across the aisles? And, and just as a sign of our solidarity that, that we are one under the blood of Christ and this is what identifies us. The Bible says that we ought to pray for kings. Just substitute the word presidents and those in high positions. So whether you like the guy after Tuesday night or you would prefer he didn't get there, you are commanded to pray for him. Commanded. And part of the reason Paul says to Timothy we're commanded is so that we the people of God may live quiet and peaceful lives and the gospel might flourish underneath their leadership. So whether they love God or could care less about God, our prayer is that the people of God are free to worship and the message of the gospel will flourish during this time, okay? That's what we want. So we're waiting for King Jesus, not President Obama or President Romney. We, we, we are looking forward to a greater day, believer, Christian, and I want you to just be reminded of that. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we thank you, God. We thank you that we live in a country where we have the privilege to vote, and I pray that every person in this room who is of voting age will go and vote and vote their conscience and will vote according to biblical values and virtues, and I pray, Lord, that, uh, that, 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 that we, would, we would not lose sight of who we really are are in the midst of all of this. God, we pray for Governor Romney. We pray for President Obama. God, whoever takes over the Oval Office, God, they are not our Messiah. And we thank you for their leadership. And at the same time, God, we are so grateful that we serve a greater king. We serve a king that rules over all. And that one day we're going to be in your presence and we're going to say thank you for every tyrant, for every good king that ever came about in this world because everything was pushing your agenda forward till the day when Jesus returned. And so we pray
praise you for that, God. And we take comfort in that today. And we pray, oh God, that you would rule and reign. Let righteousness prevail. Let it be something where we look back and we see that, 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 that God, righteousness came to dwell. We, we pray, God, for the souls of the men who will take these offices, that you'd save them, Lord. That, God, they would, they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. You've asked us to pray like this. And, Lord, we, we want to pray for them at this time. We want to pray that the, the light of the gospel, the glory of Jesus Christ, would open their eyes and they would see and they would believe and it would change them completely. Father, we love you and we thank you for the privilege that we have as Christians to serve you, the comfort we have as the people of God and God as Americans that we get to go out now and we get the privilege of voting in a country where at least 44 times there has been a peaceable transference of power. God, what a, what a gift that is and we're grateful for it. Be with us now, God, and help us to be sober-minded as we go through this week and, and, and remembering that you're in control Everything is yours, God. There is nothing that is outside of your control and providence. And we praise you for that. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 You may be seated. Um, hey, real quick, before I jump into this, uh, thanks for last week. We had Daryl and Terry McCarthy from International Institute for Christian Studies here with us. And uh, you guys, I asked you to give and help with an urgent need they have, and you gave $2,000. And so I want to thank you for that and, and your generosity in helping them. I know we continue to support them monthly, but uh, thank you for, for digging deep and, and helping us do that. Uh, and then you see some of us wearing these baptism shirts. We're going to be doing baptisms as part of all of our services next week. And so if you've not been baptized following your salvation, man, take advantage of this. What a, what a great time. I, I would just say this. Don't delay. Don't delay for sentimental reasons. Reasons. Don't, don't delay for any reason. Just be obedient and God will bless you. And so if that's you and you've not done that, fill out your connection card. Say something, you know, it says something about wanting to be baptized. You know, write that on there. We'll get back to you. We'd love to get you involved in that next week and hear what God has done in your life, okay? All right, so Mark chapter 12. Uh, when I was in, uh, when I was in uh, my, my previous life, I was a lawyer. Some of you know that. And uh, so I went to law school. And while I was in law school at University of Minnesota, I, uh, I, I um, interned or, or you know, was, was working at a, at a law firm because I wanted to kind of get experience. And it was, a, it was a personal injury law firm, one of these guys you see on TV, right? Big, big firm. And, and I, I never had a desire to do that, but I was like, well, I'll go get the experience. And it was a good experience for me. But I'll never forget there were, you know, most of the cases you had were like, oh, you know, I... I sprained my neck when that guy rear-ended me. You know, it was a lot of that stuff. But, but every now and again, there'd be something just wild that would come through the door, you'd, you'd see. And one of these is forever imprinted in my mind. It was a, there was a guy out at the Minnesota Zoo. And at the time, the Minnesota Zoo was creating this exhibit, this aviary, I think is what you call them, which are the birds, you know. And it was creating this bird show exhibit with these gigantic steel cages that would go up and down on these hydraulic lifts and then would open at certain times and the birds would fly out and they'd fly back in. It was just, you know, to the music and all this stuff. And so they're getting this all ready. And, and the guy, that I'm talking about was, was uh, I think it was an electrician or something, and he's, he's standing at the bottom of one of these hydraulic lifts, and about a 2,000-pound cage is up over his head about 30 feet high. You probably see where this is going. And, uh, and he's working on something, and something happens, and that cage breaks free of, of whatever the hydraulic lift and just starts careening toward him at the ground. And he, like anybody, just panics, right? Just drops to the ground and he's face up watching this cage come towards him and it just comes screaming towards him and stops about two inches from his face. His heart stopped and he died. He, he was literally scared to death. Not a mark on his body. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, right? I'm sorry. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, I'll, I, what, the, the impression that made on me was, wow, the power of fear. I mean, the power of fear. Fear is this incredibly powerful, life-altering force. It can kill you, literally. 
And when you come to the word of God, you will discover over and over that fear is maybe one of the greatest enemies of faith. Um, in, in fact, Jesus, you might remember back in Mark chapter 5, we looked at this with the man whose daughter is dying, and he, he, he comes to him, Jesus, please, 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 and, and finally he finds out his daughter is dead, and he drops to his knees, and, and Jesus looks at him and says, do not fear, only believe. In, in other words, Jesus is going, look, where you want to go is an opposite universe from where I want you to be. Fear and faith live in opposite worlds. And because fear will, will not only kill you instantaneously like this man, it will warp you, it will twist you, it will, it will create things in you that are the antithesis of what Christ wants to see in you. And will slowly choke out the faith of God in your life. And yet, here's the crazy thing. I know that's an extreme example, but, but let, me, let, me, let me suggest to you that fear is the engine that drives most of us. Fear is why you do what you do, why you behave the way you behave, why you say what you say so often, because, because we are afraid, we are insecure. Fear is the enemy of discipleship. Now, you understand, we, we say that the book of Mark, we're, we're answering the question, who is Jesus all through here? But the reason Mark is even asking that question is he wants people to become followers of Jesus. He wants you to become a disciple that is committed to Jesus. A disciple. And, and fear is the enemy of discipleship. And the opposite of that is true. Belief, trust, faith is the friend. So what Jesus is going to do here in Mark, or Mark's going to do here in Mark chapter 12, verse 38 to 44, is we are going to set in just massive contrast um, two sort of vignettes here. And this is placed here on purpose, okay? You're, you're, going to do, you're going to see a major contrast between what a disciple is and the motivations that drive that and what a disciple is, uh, what, what is not and, and what a disciple is and the major motivations that drive that. Okay, so, so you've got to see that Mark didn't just randomly, at the end of all this controversy, throw in something about this widow. He, he, he did this because he's saying, look, I've been, I've been dealing with these, these religious leaders, and now I'm going to set them in massive contrast to somebody I really want you to see. And this whole thing is about what it means to be a disciple. Okay, so, so the first thing Jesus is going to tell us and show us in verses 38 to 40 is what a disciple of Jesus is not is not, okay? So let's start reading and, and let's, let's look at this again. Before I read, let me, let me just say this. Where is Jesus? Remember where he is. It's the last week of his life, probably a couple days till he is crucified on the cross. He's in Jerusalem. He's, he's still in the temple. Uh, this has been a long day for Jesus of fighting with these guys. He took over the floor last week and said, I'm gonna start teaching you and he keeps teaching right now. And he's going to end, today is the end of his public teaching. He's going to take his disciples aside, and he's going to teach them a lot of things. But the crowds are no longer going to hear Jesus after this last thing that he says. And so watch what he does. And in his teaching, verse 38, Jesus, he said, beware of the scribes. Okay, I've told you about who the scribes were before. They were this elite group of men. They were interpreters of the law. They were sort of like scripture lawyers, if you will, that, that told you here's what it says and doesn't say. And here Jesus is on his last public sermon saying, beware of these men. Beware of these guys, okay? Don't take your cues. If, if, you, if you hear nothing else that I've said so far, this is my last message to you crowds. Do not be like these men. Now, does he mean that you, you should not look up to or try to emulate mature men and women of God? Well, no, I, obviously not. I mean, Paul's going to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me. What Jesus is saying is that this is the last group of people I ever want you to imitate. Don't be like these guys. See, it, 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 the, the, he's saying don't take your, your cues from religious people. 
even though on the outside they look like they have it all together and they seem so spiritual, don't do it. Okay, so let's keep going. And what Jesus is now going to do is I'm going to tell you a couple of things about what discipleship is not. Okay, and the first thing he's going to say is a disciple is not proud. A disciple is not proud. So watch what he does. Here are these guys. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. Okay, here's what's happening. These guys, um, the traditional Jewish garb was pretty bright colored. And these guys would wear these gray, you know, darker colored monochromatic uh, shawls. They were literally prayer shawls. Big, massive things they'd put over their, you know, their robes. And at the end of the corner of all the shawls, there'd be these tassels and if you if you saw someone wearing one of these long robes you knew they were a rabbi they were a teacher they were a person of wealth and 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 they loved that attention look at me I'm wearing the Armani suit right check me out I am dressed perfectly and and nobody can just afford this kind of stuff you ought to respect me he says they like greetings uh, in the marketplaces So what would happen is when a scribe, what you were supposed to do if you're a Jew, when a scribe walked down the street, you were expected to rise before him. I mean, just imagine, I walk out of church, you all have to rise. It'd be awesome. No. (laughs) Expected to rise before them. I mean, what does this do to somebody's heart? Look what else he says. He says, And they have the best seats in the synagogues and the place of honor at feasts. If if, if you come to Israel with us, and you still have time, by the way, if you want to sign up for that, but we're going to go in June. And and one of the places we'll go is a place, uh, Capernaum, where Jesus did a ton of his ministry. And and the synagogue is is almost all still standing from Jesus' day. And you'll see at the very front of the synagogue, if this were the synagogue, at the very front of the synagogue, there were these stone benches right in the front on either side of where the word of God was read And this is where the leaders, these were the best, these were called the first seats, the best seats in the synagogue. So I could face you. How many of you grew up in a church where the pastors all stood on stage, right? They sat here, you know, kind of, hey, you, all right. (laughs) And I did. I remember growing up in in church like that. And I thought, man, wow, those are like, those are holy seats up there. That's a big deal. People are up on stage. And then you'd go outside and the pastor had the you know, they all had like reserved parking spaces. It's like, wow, gee, this is a big deal. Which is why, by the way, we have no chairs up here and we park at the bank. Because um, <laughs> I, I feel like the trappings of authority and rank can just, I, I'm not saying this about my pastor. Or any, I mean, you know, if that was your pastor, may, they, they may not have had that feeling at all. But I'm saying, I think that stuff can very easily turn itself into pride in our heart. See, you see, the, the, the scripture teaches God hates pride. You understand this? It, it was the first sin, and, and, and it's probably the most pervasive human sin there is, right? You, you can hardly get away from pride. You ever notice this? Like there, there's almost no escaping it. Because as soon as you escape it, you go, hey, I'm not prideful. Dang it. Now I feel pride over not being prideful. Right? The Bible says, I mean, over and over again, God hates pride. God opposes the proud. Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 17. God says, there are six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven that the Lord detests. And topping that list is haughty eyes. (laughs) You know what haughty eyes are? They're they're like, I'm better than everyone else. I look down on you. I'm on a different plane. You're not at my level, and that's called pride. Larry Osborne, a friend of ours, ours says that if if Proverbs 6 really means what it says, that God hates haughty eyes, he would rather have us struggling with porn than pride. So I think he's right. This is a major, major sin. And Jesus is going, guys, do not be like these guys. Don't imitate them. And let's face it, pride isn't just the problem of religious leaders. Pride is my problem. Pride is your problem. We all struggle with it. We look down on people. You're not as spiritually mature. You're not quite at my plane. I like to think of myself as more advanced. I love applause. I love the pat on the back. I love the rising. You know, wow, there's a man of God, and God hates it. 
a, a disciple is not proud. And the second thing is the disciple is not greedy. Now look what he says in verse 40. This is a little bit enigmatic. Listen to what he says. Who, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. We've all seen people like that. They will receive the greater condemnation. But what does he mean? They devour widows' houses. That, that, that's a little bit strange. And probably here's what's happening. Um, the, the, Josephus, uh, m- many of you might know, Josephus was a, was a historian of the Jews who lived after Jesus' time, just a, 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 maybe a decade or two, and, uh, and wrote a, about the history of the Jews. And one of the stories he tells was that in the time of Jesus, there, there was this story that was circulated, and they, they believe it to be true, that there was a scribe who was exiled to Rome. He was exiled out of Jerusalem, and, and he was a scoundrel. And so he, d- he decided that what he was going to do, he went to these rich widows who had been left wealth by their dead husbands, and he went to them, and he, he, uh, it, it, and he went to one in particular named Fulvia, and he convinced Fulvia to donate a bunch of money to the temple back in Jerusalem. But unbeknownst to Fulvia, he was actually taking the money and using it on himself. He was, he was, he was taking away from her and he was using his esteem, using his respect in that office to, to basically uh, exploit and embezzle from people. I, 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 I don't think it's a stretch to say that this is a little bit like the guys today who are saying, hey, send me your money, right? And I'll I'll bless this hanky and send it back to you, and then I'll take all your money and drive around in my Escalade with blacked out windows and nice rims. I really don't care about you. I, I just can use this little thing to dangle in front of you. They're not greedy. But okay, but here's the, the question. This is why I started the way I did. Why are people like this? Did they start this? Are these just, are these just black-hearted people? I mean, do people just like, I'm just, I'm just evil, and, and so I want to devour widows' houses. What turns religiously zealous men, women, into prideful, greedy people? What, why do they do all this? Maybe more importantly, why do you and I do that? Have you ever said of yourself, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Well, I, I think I've already told you part of the answer. I, I have this deep belief that what motivates so many of us and turns us into something that we were never intended to be is fear. Fear. We're terrified. Insecurity. And I think what fear does to you, it's not innocent. It's not, it's not um, uh, just neutral in your life. It deforms you. It it sours your soul. And I think fear is the drive shaft, the engine that motivates so much of who we are and what we do. But okay, but what fear? Well, we could probably list hundreds of things this morning. Let me give you several and show you what I mean. How about just the fear of man? Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare. Those who trust in the Lord are safe. See, see, I'm afraid, and this motivates so many of us. We are so afraid of what other people think of us. Right, you see this in little kids. You see this in like, they get to be about what, that middle school range and man, suddenly I can't stand out and I'm afraid what my friends will think. All those things, right? And, and yet, and, and we think that's, that's immature, but how many adults are like that? I am afraid of what people, I'm so afraid of offending or standing out or standing up for what's right because it might mean I'm not as popular. It might mean I'm rejected. It might mean somebody's upset at me. And I, I want everybody to like me. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of people. 
Or how about this? How about fear of rejection? This is very similar, right? I mean, if people knew the real me, I can't tell you who I am, so I have to play games with you. I can't let you see who I really am because I'm scared you'll reject me. I'm not the spiritual giant, but I need you to think that I am. I'm not the perfect mom or dad. I'm not the perfect child, but if people don't see me that way, they'll reject me, and we're terrified of rejection. Fear of insignificance, right? I mean, our, 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 our drive, we so desperately want to be significant, do significant things in this world. I don't know anybody who says, you know, I'm okay just being insignificant. No, we, we want, right? We, we have the craving. So, I mean, so did the scribes. We want to be seen as significant, so we wear the right shawl, and we, you know, so I drive the, the right car, and I live in the right zip code, in the right neighborhood, and my kids go to the right school. Now, I'm not saying that that is what's, if you have a nice car, good, good. That's, I'm not saying that's you. I'm saying that's so many of us. We are, we, we are told we're significant by every advertisement out there, by the piece of metal that's wrapped around us as we drive down the highway. Is that just not pitiful? And that's us. I am significant because of these things, and I'm terrified. And here's what happens. All these things begin to warp your soul, begin to strangle out who God intended you to be. Or how about this, fear of pain? And let me, let me explain this one. Because I'll be honest with you, I see this a lot in younger, younger people. Because we pray, here's how we hyper-spiritualize it. Right? I'm just I'm praying for God's will. Right? I'm praying for God's will that he'll show me and make it crystal clear to me. what. I, so he'll send me a sign. And then I'm going to hear you say a word this morning that maybe I'll see on a billboard later. And then it'll be sung in a song. And then I'll know this is God. Because I need to know for sure, God, you're in this. And I don't want to walk through that door if, if it's going to go bad. Because we think if it goes bad, we must be outside of God's will. Eh, wrong. Anybody in here over 40, over 30, will tell you, doesn't matter what you do, life is going to kick you in the teeth. And the fact of the matter is, God will allow that at times. And he'll do that because he's saying, look, all things work together, and there's stuff you'll never learn without going through pain. And so, so, so he's saying, look, you, you want me to make it this utter certainty. You think of life like a tightrope, and I'm so afraid that if I, if I go, you know, if I step to this side, it's gloom and doom, and I'm going to feel pain and God's saying, you know, sometimes you will, and sometimes I've ordained that for you. And you know what it does? It shuts down your ability to take radical risks for Jesus. Because, man, you've you got to be certain. That is not the way the will of God works. How about this? How, how about fear of missing out? Right? I mean, think about this. How many people do you know that maybe deep down, maybe some of you in this room, you don't want to become a Christian. You don't want to give your life and surrender to Christ because I may miss out, right? I mean, this world, I got to grab it by the horns and I got to take it for everything it'll give me. And if I become a Christian, my life turns boring and I can't do everything that's presented in this world for me. I will miss out. And you know what the Bible says? It's okay, you know what? There will be things in this world that you don't get a chance to do because you're sacrificing your life radically for Jesus Christ elsewhere. <laughs> but when we get to the life to come, you, you don't even know food like you're going to taste. You don't even know experiences like you're going to experience. You don't even know places that you've not seen before that are going to blow. You miss nothing. Have you done this? God, I'm not married yet. Please, Jesus, don't come back until I'm married and get to have sex. I, 
I, I prayed like that. I'm just going to tell you. Um, <laughs> we, we fear we won't be happy. And so what happens is I have to then take control of my life. And because I fear missing out, and I fear not being financially wealthy, whatever, I will do even monstrous things like devouring widows' houses. Or how about this? How about the fear of not pleasing God? This is, this is at the heart of religion. Your fear turns to religion because we are afraid of not pleasing God. And religion seems to give us this tidy answer of just work harder, do more, do better, and God will be pleased. And so I have to be more religious than you and you than me because God has a standard and it's up to me to meet that standard. And I am terrified and I think this, this will warp you and deform you because it becomes what must I do and it's never ever good enough is it ever you get those moments of like okay i really did everything this week now jesus is pleased with me and then you realize well crap now i'm prideful <laughs> see I, I have to tell you in some way i feel sorry for these men they are warped and twisted because there is something deep down that is motivating this. They are so afraid of missing out and not being respected and not being seen as significant that it absolutely warps and deforms their hearts. See, some of you are so governed by fear. Here's what will happen. If that, this is why I say it's the enemy of discipleship. Because if fear is the driving influence, you will say to me, you'll say to other people, when it comes to be obedient to Jesus and being driven by fear, you'll say things like, I can't obey Jesus, wherever that is. And the heart reason is, is because I'm terrified. I have to be disobedient to Jesus over here and sleep with my girlfriend because I am terrified of being alone. I, I, I have to, you know, I, I, I have to get a, a few extra dollars on my, you know, my, my expense report, even though it's not quite true, because I'm terrified of not being financially successful. We go on and on. I will disobey Christ because fear is motivating me. See, look at some of the most fearful people I know are the most religious. Some of the most insecure people are, are, are some of the wealthiest. Some of the most driven people are deeply, deeply insecure. No, don't take that. If you're, if you're wealthy, I'm not saying you're insecure. I'm saying that's true of what drives so many of us. But, but, okay, so that's the scribes, and Jesus doesn't want to leave us there. So, so now he's going to say, okay, let's talk about what a disciple is. So let's, let's watch what he does. Okay, so we finished teaching. He goes, and he sat down, verse 41, opposite the treasury, and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. Now, is this not interesting? That Jesus says, I'm going to choose to teach you discipleship by going to the offering box. This becomes, for Jesus, the laboratory for, for discipleship, for being a follower of Jesus. Why is that? Why? Why does he do that? Because giving more than almost anything else in your life, in my life, reflects the true state of our hearts. There's no denying it. Jesus says that where your treasure, where your heart is, your, your treasure will follow. Your wallet and your heart are tethered together. I tell you this all the time because that's the Bible. You cannot escape it. Generosity will never flow out of a greedy heart. Sacrifice does not spill out of a selfish heart. Radical giving doesn't come out of a fearful heart. It can't. 
that's too scared. And so Jesus says, guys, come with me, and I want to show you what real discipleship is. Isn't this interesting? I mean, in the midst of all that, and Jesus puts this little story about the widow. See, don't ever say Jesus doesn't care about money. He does. In fact, he cares enough to go sit so close to the offering buckets that he can see exactly what coins people are putting in. This is crazy, isn't it? So, so okay, here's what would happen. You'd come to the temple to give your, your gifts, and, you, and there was this treasury part of the temple. It was out in the court of women, and, uh, and, and here's what, what would be set up. They had, they had 13 receptacles in the temple, and, and they were like these chests, and, and going into them were, were called trumpets. They were these metal trumpets that sort of scoped out as they got bigger. That's why they called them trumpets. And, and you would come in and you would drop your offering into whatever, all of those were designated for something. You'd, you'd drop them and you'd, you'd pour the money in. Well, imagine, this is before, right? there were no credit cards and online giving and silent bills. Everything you gave was a metal coin in a metal trumpet, right? So, so imagine, I'm a rich person, and I come to give my gift. It had to sound like the person in Vegas who just hit the slot jackpot. Ching, 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 ching. I mean, it's just, just, wow, listen to that. That, whoo, that guy, he loves Jesus. That guy's spiritual. And I imagine, you know, everybody stood back at these moments. It just keeps going. Wow, listen to those large sums of money. This is amazing. I mean, just the sound, it just echoed. There's your marble walls in the temple at the time. There was no acoustical tile. It'd be bouncing off of everything. Everyone would hear this. How awesome would that be if you gave a big gift? Everybody knows. Wow, that, you know, that, that was really generous of you today. Well, thank you. Look at verse 42. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Okay, back up. Think of the scene. Guys, come here. Sit right here. Let's watch. Rich people come in. Shh. Here comes this woman. It's obvious she's poor. Jesus knows she's a widow, which, by the way, those have been almost synonymous terms. If you were a widow, you were probably poor. And it's obvious, and she walks in, and she'd have to walk up to the priest in charge and tell him, here's what I'm giving today. Here's my offering. Here's a woman. She's got no safety net. She's got no family to take care of her. Maybe she's dressed in tatters. She's the lowest person on the social scale. She's not wearing a shawl. And she walks up to the trumpet designated for her offering and just goes, clink. That's it. And you got to wonder what did people do? Why bother? What's the point? I mean, does she not know? Look at who she's following. Or did they simply? kind of go, we didn't even notice. I didn't even see her. She's that insignificant to me. And what's one penny going to do? Seriously. Did anyone even hear her? (laughs) 
verse 43. And he, Jesus, called his disciples to him. You know what happened? Those two coins were like thunderclaps in Jesus' ears. He's like, whoa, whoa, guys, guys. It doesn't say, by the way, the literal word there is he summoned them. He summons them. You have got to see what I just saw. And the disciples were probably like, what? Like, what had just happened, right? We didn't see anything. I know you didn't. But I just saw something that blew my mind. And he says, truly I say to you. Now, don't ever skip over Jesus saying, truly I say to you. That means I'm about to tell you something mind-blowing. I'm about to tell you something that you probably ought to take out your pen and paper, guys, and write this one down. This is big. And then he says something that is astonishing. She gave more than anyone. Now, there's a couple ways we could take that. We could say in comparison to any individual gift that was given that day, she gave more. Or, in comparison to the combined gifts of everything you've seen so far, she gave more. I think that's what Jesus is saying. He is saying that the smallest act of sacrifice is bigger than the biggest act of religion. But why, Jesus, why would you say that? Why would you say she gave more? Look at at verse 44. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Stop there. (laughs) You see what he says? He says, guys, not because she gave more money. I think we all know that. She gave a penny. They gave hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's because she gave everything she had. In fact, I have not found an English translation that says it as radically as it's written in the Greek. It says literally this. She gave the whole life of hers. Her bios is how it it reads in the Greek. she, She gave her life. That's how deep she dug for this offering. See, look at in God's economy, do you understand this? It's not about how much you give, it's how much you sacrifice. Because let's face it, most of us, including your pastor, give out of our abundance, and when there is no abundance, we don't give. Well, I'll hear things like this. Can't afford to. I can't, I don't have any. And the reason I say that we give out of our abundance is the fact that like the rich people in this, and, and by the way, you're not the widow, you're rich, um, is that after we give, nothing is different for us. Nothing. I can still put gas in my car. Can you? I can still put food on my table for my kids. Can you? I can still pay my mortgage. I can still do everything I wanted to do. And you say, well, Chris, of course. That's just being a good steward. That's just being wise with your money. That's just being responsible. Okay, what is it? See, I mean, if you're, if you're an investment advisor and a, and, a, and a woman walks into your office, you've got an appointment, she walks in and says, hey, my, my husband died six years ago. All I've got left are these $2 bills right here, and I really have this urge to go give them to the church. And you're a Christian guy, you're a Christian gal, and what would you say to her? Sweetie, because we talk down to poor people. Um, you know, I don't think that's what God wants you to do. God wants you to be responsible. God, God wants you to have food in your stomach. God, God wants this for you. Now, now, just go home and go buy yourself something to eat. Probably. That's what we'd say. Next appointment, uh, you know, Mr. Moneybags is here. and uh, Can you see him now? Sure, come on in. And he walks in and he says, hey, craziest thing. Man, God's been good to me. I've made a lot of money. So much money, in fact. I'm a farmer and I got to go, and I've got so much grain built up for my retirement that I got to build 
several extra barns to house all my grain. And you sit there and go, well, wow, you are a wise man. You, you've done really well, and I respect that, and good for you. And that would be exactly the opposite of what Jesus would say. Because Jesus looks at this woman, and he holds her up and says, this is discipleship. And in Luke 16, he looks at that man and says, you're a fool. <laughs> See, but, but here, again, here's the question. Why? Why would she, why would anybody do this? Why would you give all you have, your whole life, why would you give so sacrificially that it was literally going to mean, I don't eat tonight? Why? Why would anybody do that? Listen, there is only one thing that would motivate you to do that. You have a deep, deep, more than intellectual understanding and faith, trust, belief in the radical love of God in Christ for you. Nothing else will motivate that. See, John says in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, none, gone, it's gone. But perfect love casts out, I mean, throws it away, fear. Uh, who's perfect love? It's not your wife, it's not your kids, it's not a friend. Nobody has loved you perfectly except Jesus, who proved to you his love on the cross. And so the only thing that switches out that motivation of fear is, is now I can trust in this radical, self-giving love of Christ that goes, spares no expense for me. And I don't need to be motivated by fear, right? The fear of not pleasing God because Jesus pleased him already on the cross. I don't, I don't need to be motivated by the fear of being insignificant because now I am motivated by the significance that can only come, only, there's no other place by knowing I'm a child of God. I don't need to be motivated by the fear of being alone because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't need to be motivated by the fear of not living up to God's standard because Jesus came down to me. And Christianity, by the way, is the only religion in the world that teaches that. Everything else, you know, the five pillars of Islam, you, you, you do these things and you'll reach up to God. The path of enlightenment in Buddhism, you, you do these things, you'll reach up to be God-like and Christianity says you'll never get there, so Jesus will come to you. And I don't need to be motivated by the fear of man because when I am afraid, I put, I place, I tell myself, you put your faith in God. You trust in Jesus, in God whose word I praise, in God I will trust. I will not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And I don't have to be motivated by fear of like I'm not gonna be provided for. What's gonna happen to me? I can be radically generous because I am totally loved, protected, and cared for, but you'll never do this. You can't do this if you're afraid. And you can't do this if Christianity for you is merely intellectual and this is not seeped deep into your soul. See, see, Jesus isn't saying, you know, it's great, this woman let go and, and let this remote, distant, uncaring God come and take control of her life. She let go because she intellectually believed something. No way, not a chance. He's saying, let me show you trust. Let me show you what happens when you understand God came near, God lived with us, and then showed how much he cared by giving his whole life. This woman's just pointing to Jesus. And if you can really see that that's what Jesus did for you, do you understand that? You won't be motivated by fear anymore. You, you will feel perfect love and it will cast out all fear and for, you'll, you'll be free, free. 
I don't know how many of you have ever heard the name Charles Blondin. Probably not. He was a tightrope walker, so I'd be really, really surprised if he did. In 1858, Charles Blondin, uh, in June, uh, June 30 uh, of 1858, he was the first person to cross the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Guy was amazing. I mean, I read the story. I was like, this guy is crazy. So he, 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 he promoted it. Hey, I'm going to do this. He strung the rope, and at 5 p.m. that evening, 1858, he sets out to cross on this hemp rope that goes all the way from the American to the Canadian side. And all he has, he has no safety net, all he has is a 50-pound balancing pole made of ash. And the thing sags in the middle and comes back because they couldn't figure out how to, make that, to fix that. So he goes out, and he, and he starts to cross, and he makes it all the way to the Canadian side, no problems. Decides, you know, let's up the ante. This was too easy. So he grabs one of those daguerreotype cameras, you know, the kind that you have to put your head under a hood. And he puts it on his back, walks out to the middle, puts the camera on the rope, puts his head under the camera, and takes a picture of everybody standing on the American side. Puts it back on his, and walks the other side. It was like, whoa, what an unbelievable. So he's like, well, that was good. I'd like to do that again. So he started promoting these events where he was going to cross the Niagara Falls, and he upped the ante every time. So I think it was July 4th is the next time he did it, so he came back out, rope still strung. He puts a a bag over his head where he can't see anything and walks and comes back. He does it another time where he is chained in shackles. Another time he does somersaults and and tumbles all the way across and all the way. My favorite. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he, he went and got a wheelbarrow, put a stove in the wheelbarrow, rolled it to the center, cooked an omelet, and made it, ate it, right? He took a table and chairs and sat it out there and then balanced and put his feet up on the table while sitting in a chair, and then the chair broke out from under him. Well, he decided, okay, I've pretty much done everything, so, so now I want to take a man across. And so he put an advertisement saying, I'll give $1,000 to any man that will do it. This is 1858. That's a ton of money. So all these guys show up. Yeah, well, oh, my gosh. That's incredible, right? So he, they get there. He takes them up to the falls. They see the roaring falls out there. He puts like a 200-pound a sack on his back, and he walks across and walks back to say, look, I, I can do this. I want to show you this. And so he asks every guy. You know, he whittles it down because he couldn't take guys that were, you know, 800 pounds or whatever. He, he, has, to, he has to go, you've got to be a certain body type or whatever. So he, he narrows it down to this, this field of guys. They watch him do that, and he says to them, do you believe I can, I can take you across on my back. Every single one of them. Yes. And then he said, are you willing to get on my back and cross with me? Every one of them. Not on your life. (laughs) See, there's a big difference, right? There's a big difference between I believe and doing what your belief says. There's a difference between saying I trust Jesus with my life and trusting Jesus with your life. There's a big difference between walking around in flowing robes and acting pious, and I believe when people are watching and believing so much that you give everything. So Charles Bond and what he did is he convinced his manager, Harry Colcord, he said, Harry, you're gonna have to do this with me. And so Harry... They, they, they set out that day. Harry jumps on his back, and they start walking. Well, what would you do if you're Harry? Things start to sway. Where do you go? Ah, whoa. You know, you're like, he starts moving. This way, you move. the other, And he says, finally, he stops. And over the falls, people hear him scream to Harry, Harry, look up. You are no longer Colcord. You are Blondin. Until I clear this place, Harry, be a part of me, mind, body, and soul. If I sway, sway with me. Do not attempt to balance yourself. If you do, we will both go to our death. If you try to save yourself, Harry, if you try to save yourself, Harry, you'll lose, you'll die. Jesus said, the exact same thing. If you try to save yourself, Chris, you'll die. Blondin said, you, you, must, 
you must sway when I sway, right? Be one with me completely. And this is what it means to be a Christian. I rest in Christ. I cling to him, and it's scary. And sometimes I give everything I have, and I trust in Christ alone. They made it across, just so you know. And the only way you're going to make it across is through Jesus Christ. That's it. But you've got to trust him. You've got to really trust him. And then listen. Then you're free, right? You're free. You're not, you're not bound by fear anymore. Free from bondage. Free to give radically. Free to give your whole life. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a disciple. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we ask you, Lord, save us from our fears. Help us to put our trust in you when we're afraid. Cause this to run deeply, I pray. So, so, so we're free to give and to live and to serve and to take risks for the glory of God. God, I pray if there's people here this morning that don't know Jesus Christ, they're so afraid they're going to give up something when you're saying you give up nothing. What awaits us in the life to come, we will look back and say, man, I, I can't even say that I suffered. I got everything. So God, we don't want to just believe this intellectually. That'll never save us. We want to cling to you, sway with you when it feels risky, knowing that you've, you've already plunged and you're the only one that can save us and the only one who can get us across to the other side. So may we rest in you today. And may you cast out your perfect love, cast out our fears. In Jesus' name we pray.